Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. In 2018, Libraries Today took a look at how both public libraries and the WVLC serve West Virginia families. We look back at how the Library TV Network got started, visited with the Librarian of Congress, discussed genealogy with library specialists, and visited libraries in South Charleston, Clendenin, Parkersburg, Union, Morgantown, and Grafton. Let's take a look back at libraries today in 2018. Forty years ago, the West Virginia Library Commission had a vision to create a television studio which would produce high-quality content for all West Virginians. The programming would focus on information on health, history, community issues, and, of course, public libraries. In our April episode, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Library Television Network. So when all this started, what was, what was your vision? What did you want this studio and this network to become? Fred's vision, and I shared the vision, was that there's a lot to know. And television was the emerging technology to make that happen. Well, it had to be a little unusual to have a TV studio in a library setting. Well, I think that was um, a natural extension of the information delivery that libraries are responsible for. We are a repository for knowledge, like, like Alexandria's library. Um, and in order to be able to distribute that knowledge or that information out to the, to the public, television was the perfect vehicle. We decided uh, the main thrust was information. And uh, our programming was always had to have a theme of informing the patron viewer. How many hours did you have to fill Gosh, in I the I think early we, days? We, we were on seven hours the first month or two. Programming hours kept increasing over the years. Yeah, it was, uh, the popularity of the programming was what was amazing. Uh, we started out with a couple of hours on Capital Cable in the afternoon, like 3 to 5. It started catching on. You know, local cable company started picking up. St. Albans picked it up. Logan picks them up. Williamson picks them up. Um, Parkersburg started expanding the, the broadcast day. Then Capital came back and gave us three hours. And then it changed to 12 hours a day. So it just expanded and on and on and on. Now I think they're distributed to cable companies all over the state. It's a uh, big footprint these days. And why don't you explain what the programming is like today? Well, the programming now is, uh, it's still agency-based. Uh, we we try, to, try to maintain that as much as possible. But we also deal with local organizations as well. We have volunteers that come in and host shows. And they have to stay within that public information or educational uh, niche that, uh, that, that, that kind of like what Dave and them started, uh, we've just expanded it just out of just a little bit more. How many hours do you fill now? We fill about 72 hours a week. When you look back at your days here in the studio, what are your best memories? Oh, it was, we were just crazy people. We had, we, we had a motto, if it isn't fun, don't do it. When we needed to be serious, we were very serious. Um, I think there was a lot of production talent around. Um, we weren't afraid to fail. Uh, we just wanted to do the best we could with what we had. And it was a great time. Well, it was a lot of fun. You know, where else can you, can you get a job that something you like to do and get paid for it? It was pretty neat. And I got to meet a lot of cool people. And, and I realized that other people who come in and volunteer, they don't get paid for it. Uh, a lot of the hosts, and volunteers that came in over the years. Um, some of them still come in, even to this day, I think of um, Sharon King. Mm -hmm. She still does a lot of programming. Um, Randy Dameron. Randy's been here for years and years and years. Um, Dr. Rashid, still doing a show after probably 25 years. I, I have to go back and check the dates. But those guys don't get paid to do it, and, and evidently they love it or they wouldn't be, wouldn't be volunteering their time to do, to do that. And I think they don't get enough appreciation. So thanks, guys, for toughing it out all those years. <laughs> the people that I ran into, the people that I was blessed to work with, the creative people 
that came in to mine and we would sit down and I would always sit down with them in a production meeting and say, what if we could do this? That was always my mantra, what if? And they would say, well, Dave, we could do this, this, this. So that was 20 some years worth of beautiful memories of people coming in, creative minds working and coming up with ideas about programming, about ideas and how to's and so on and so forth. If I had one person that comes to mind that really set this apart and that really, really saved the Library Commission channel would be Sharon King. Sharon King went above and beyond uh, helping the Library Commission with developing programmings uh, and with developing the structure and the stability of this, this service of the library. Mark, in addition to regular programming that Dave and you have talked about, you also do, the studio also handles special programming uh, for the governor, for the first lady. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the special programming you do? Yes, um, as you mentioned with the governor's office, uh, we're, we're at his beck and call if he needs us to go and shoot a uh, press conference or uh, shoot a, an event that he's at, we will go and shoot a, an event and, uh, and, and put that together for them in inter any format that they want that in. Uh, we also do special productions uh, for the agencies, uh, for the organizations come to us and they want uh, a video produced for uh, either the web, uh, for use to pass around or hand out in, in, a, in, a, in a hard format and uh, we can produce those as well, either here in the studio or out on location, uh, and give that to them in, in several different media forms. What is your vision for the future for the Library Commission Network? Well, expansion as always. Uh, I'd like to go farther out and make sure that more people see what we're doing. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do is, is the facility uh, is not full HD yet. Um, we'd like to, like to get the equipment to, to step that forward. I would like to say that the future is far and beyond what the Library Commission hopes to have. This, this is going to be what Mark is going to be developing. It's going to be a beautiful system. If I ever could say anything great about Mark and extending this and carrying this, this torch on, it would be high praises to Mark. He undoubtedly has gotten the torch and carried it forward. And look at this place. It is beautiful. In our May episode, we had the rare opportunity to visit with the most important librarian in the country, the United States Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Dr. Hayden is the first woman and the first African-American to hold the position. And she's the first professional librarian to lead the Library of Congress in over 60 years. After working in libraries in Chicago and Baltimore, she was appointed the 14th Librarian of Congress by President Barack Obama in 2016. She was also president of the American Library Association from 2003 to 2004. You know, a Library of Congress is, uh, I believe, the oldest federal institution. Yes, we like to say the first. The first, the first federal institution. I really think that shows the founding fathers placed a lot of importance yes. on libraries. Do you feel the libraries, not just Library of Congress, but public libraries, are still relevant and still oh, important? Oh, my goodness. And all I had to do is go home to Baltimore that I do every night. And I know that libraries are really, in most communities, opportunity centers. They're the places that people not only can get online to get jobs, but they have literacy programs, they have programs for teens. All of these things make libraries vital in communities. You can get your flu shot at a library. <laughs> One of the most interesting things that I've kind of found out in, in researching the Library of Congress is that a lot of people don't realize it's a library. Right. And so how do you, I mean, how do you, explain to folks, hey, we're a library just like your public library down the street. We're the largest reference library in the world. The only people who can actually physically check out materials mm -hmm. are members of Congress, but also 
other libraries. And so we lend materials to other libraries. We also have collections that we're digitizing that'll be at everyone's fingertips. And we have programs like Letters About Literature, uh, Center for the Book. We do so many things. And what we want to do now, and this is what really attracted me to uh, the position, is to let people know about it. We've been called one of the best kept secrets mm. in the country. We don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And we want to get the word out about what the Library of Congress can do for local libraries. How does the average citizen access your collection? The easiest way from anywhere is through the website, loclibrarycongress.gov. And people can get into the digitized collections. They can download photographs. We have an extensive uh, prints and photographs uh, archive. They can chat with curators and librarians. They can really explore all of the resources right there online. What do you think the future holds for public libraries? Public libraries are now also viewed by the public as those places to get help, to have sanctuary, and to help them live their best lives. And so public libraries are places in communities. And in some communities, they're the only place that people can come together, that they can get that kind of help. And so the future is bright. We all have challenges. Technology is keeping us on our toes. However, I think the appreciation for what libraries do is, is still strong. When we come back, we'll look back at more of Libraries Today from 2018. We are looking back at Libraries Today in 2018. Thanks for being with us. Genealogy has captured the nation's attention, from using services like Ancestry.com to taking trips to the local cemetery. Millions of Americans have become amateur genealogists, and public libraries can play a crucial role in all of this, as we learned in August from genealogist Jim Miracle from the Parkersburg Wood County Library. I've had people come in who absolutely know nothing about genealogy and want to know how to do it. So therefore, I take them to the basic family group sheet, which is a great tool to get started. And I get them to put down what they know, because you can't find out what you don't know if you don't know, have what you know. You've got to grow that tree. So you, I, especially kids, I say, go talk to your grandparents, go talk to your dad, your mom. And it's unfortunate nowadays, there's a lot of kids who I don't think they really know who their mom and her dad is. And that's going to be a problem for genealogy one of these days. But with the advent of DNA, that can solve some of those problems. You can check the DNA record and match some of that stuff up. So there are ways to get around those supposed brick walls that people get into. Now, if somebody has a more advanced or is into this a little more, uh, we have all kinds of books. We have a section with West Virginia stuff. We have sections with uh, biographies, book style, with uh, uh, biographies of different families, the Baileys, the Chancellors, people are from, from this area, plus families that are from Virginia, different parts of the country. We have county records from every county in, Wood, in, in West Virginia. And a lot of counties from Virginia, Ohio, stuff that's, that's relevant to our area. Those that we don't have, we have Ancestry. It's free. For, it's one of the things we offer free to our pay, patrons. We also have Heritage Quest, which you can, uh, you can use here. You can also get from home with your library card. What advice do you have for other libraries who are interested in stepping up their, their game? Well... One of the goals with the genealogy section here is that I uh, would like to be a resource for any of the smaller libraries who don't have the resources or need help to set up those things, and uh, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, big thing is collect, get in contact with your local uh, historical societies. They're a treasure. Uh, <laughs> They can help you get stuff. You need the network, network, network. 
So get in contact with them. If you want to start set, setting up a local library, put it in the press that you're wanting to set up a local history section, and you'll be surprised stuff people start bringing in. Uh, people find stuff in their house at all time, or somebody dies and they don't know what to do with their local history. Remember your history. You know, if you forget your his, history, we're doomed to fail. And I think sometimes we forget that. And if it wasn't for those ancestors, we wouldn't be here today. One of the most important programs that public libraries offer are summer reading programs. Research indicates that students who don't read over the summer school break suffer from learning loss, putting them at a distinct disadvantage when school starts back up in the fall. And children living in poverty are even more likely to lose reading and comprehension skills over the summer than children from more advantaged backgrounds. One library that takes its role in summer learning very seriously is the South Charleston Public Library, who we visited last June, spending some time with youth services librarian, Denise Norris. Who takes part in the program? Our program is for all ages. Our youth services program serves kids from birth to 18. So we have programs specifically geared towards early childhood education. We have our preschool program, school age, which is basically five years old to 12 years old. And then our teens who run from age 13 to 18. We also are unique that we have an adult program as well. So everybody in the family can come and have some fun <laughs> with us this summer. Well, it sounds like it's a lot of hard work to put all this together. What goes into it? <laughs> a lot of hard work, it does indeed. <laughs> um, but we want to make it as fun as we possibly can for the young people. So we're very fortunate to have a strong team here at South Charleston Public Library, and we are, are all very committed to readers of all ages. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of outreach in the community mm -hmm. and different things to bring people in and get things lined up. So today's our big exciting mm -hmm. start, and we're ready to have people come in and start having some fun. As a youth services librarian, what is your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is, I would uh, say, probably finding the absolute perfect book for every young person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's half the fun of the position, to really work with them and get to know them a little bit and be able to find some recommendations that if they really liked Harry Potter, what might they else like to read, um, and being able to order all those. So that's a bit of a challenge because the media changes and pricing has increased over mm -hmm. the years. So resources from time to time, but we're very fortunate here to have community support. What advice do you have for other libraries and their summer programs? Um, go into it both feet first. Um, don't be hesitant to go out and call on your community to join in the fun as well. And just invite the kids to come spend some time in the library and go have a good time. What's the number one item on your wish list? The number one item on my wish list is to have all the kids in this valley uh, introduced to reading and the love of reading and to... Uh, um, utilize libraries on a regular basis and enjoy the time they're with us. How do you use technology and other formats besides books uh, in the program? We use a lot of technology. As I mentioned, the social media to get word out and share information about our programs. We use that social media and our website to highlight a lot of our collection, new books we may be getting in or, or recommended reads that some of our other teens might be interested in sharing with other teens about what they've read. Um, we also have um, a lot of tablets in-house. Uh, we're partnering with PBS for a new program we're going to be doing this fall with some coding for young people. Um, so we've got tablets that people can come in and use from time to time. So we're really just trying to expose them to the technology, showing them how to use their devices to download like Hoopla, um, Freegal, a whole bunch of different online resources we make available. We'll continue our look back at libraries today in 2018 after this. Welcome back to our look back at 2018 on Libraries Today. The first library in Morgantown was established in 1926 by the Morgantown Women's Club. It spent nearly 40 years in the city's municipal building before moving to its current facility in 1964. And branch libraries in Blacksville, Arnettsville, the Cheat area, and the Clinton District were eventually founded. Today, the Morgantown Public Library System serves over 100,000 residents. In November, we paid a visit to the Morgantown Public Library and its director, Sarah Palfrey. Morgantown is definitely a college town um, with all the good and bad that comes with that. And, and it really is. Uh, I mean, you can, you can see it as a glass, 
glass half full or glass half empty. I love it. Uh, it's vibrant. Um, there's always something going on. So we do have a very unique community here. It has an ebb and flow to it that goes along with the, um, the college year, you know, which, which is a lot of fun because Morgantown has a whole the town in the summer, you know, gets a little slower, a little lazier. It's definitely not <laughs> as many sirens. <laughs> But the library, of course, in the summer, we all know, is our busiest time of the year. So we are like the happening place in the <laughs> Morgantown in the summer. So that's kind of fun. We have a lot of great traditional uh, story time programs, but then we also have a Read Baby Read program for babies. And this has been hugely popular. Um, I mean, sometimes there's close to 20 kids in there like you just can't stand the cuteness in that room <laughs> um we also have a wonderful read to rover program in the evenings uh which is nice to be able to offer our programming at a variety of times during the day to reach different groups um, so elementary age kids can sign up to read to a dog for 15 minutes dogs don't judge you when you mispronounce <laughs> words or or criticize your reading choices. So they make excellent listeners. And um, they hang out on the carpet right here in the kids section and, um, and just chill out and read. We've got one coming up this month with um, Spark, which is a children's museum. Uh, they're coming to help us do a Frankenstein program. And because we're doing Frankenstein, the WVU's uh, neuroscience student organization is also coming to help. <laughs> <laughs> they may be bringing brains. So, you know, again, advantages of a <laughs> university community. And they've got an ongoing teen and tween book clubs and teen movie nights that have been really popular. Maybe because there's free pizza. But, <laughs> there you, you know. Go. Um, and then we do a variety of adult programming too, book clubs and uh, authors. Um, the All Center is starting to do a lot more adult programming too. What exactly is the All Center? The All Center is part of the Morgantown Public Library next door. We're actually built around the core collection of our local history and genealogy section from next door, which we moved over when we acquired the house. And we spent about four years uh, restoring it and uh, making it public friendly, and we brought our collection over, and here we are. How long have you been here? Since 2004. We opened in 2004. We got the house in 2000. It took us about four years, and we've been open since 2004. And since then, we've probably uh, at least doubled the collection, maybe more. Uh, well, tell me about the collection. What all do you have in here? Well, we have uh, basic history books, of course, on local and regional history. And uh, we also have a lot of family histories. We have a couple of private collections that uh, one was the result of about 55 years of research and uh, was donated to us. Uh, we have a lot of uh, families that were either local families or families who um, had at some point in time lived here and put down some sort of roots here. Um, this was a region that was highly transitory. People came through on their way west lived here a while. I mean, we've got a lot of local uh, family histories and census reports, marriage records, cemetery readings, district court records. When we return, we'll look back at the West Virginia Library Commission and how it all started. Every child is curious. George, look what I found. Turn their curiosity into a lifelong love of learning. Create a curious reader. This is super bedtime reading. Share a book together today. Visit read.gov. For nearly 90 years, the West Virginia Library Commission has assisted, advised, and counseled public libraries in developing a culture that values reading, education, and freedom of access to information. Created by the state legislature in 1929 and originally located in Morgantown, the WVLC eventually moved to Charleston and finally found a permanent home in the State Culture Center in 1976. In December, we look back at its history and the impact it's had on West Virginia public libraries. Well, very early, Gordon Bennett was our first uh, secretary. He was based out of Morgantown. 
and uh, he did not last very long. In about a year or so, he left. Then Claire Johnson was our second executive secretary of the Library Commission, serving essentially as the state librarian, and she only lasted a few years. But then Dora Ruth Parks was appointed as the uh, executive secretary, and Dora Ruth Parks lasted many, many years, and she helped shepherd some of the federal money and lay the groundwork for many of the programs that Fred Glazer took on, and he was the great builder of many of the libraries in the state. In some of the early days, uh, many of the libraries uh, were started and founded by women's clubs. And if you kind of look through the history of individual libraries, you see it time and time again. Probably about a third of all of the public libraries were established by women's clubs or women's civic groups. And that was uh, for a lot of reasons. One, they were movers and shakers in their communities, and so they got things going. But also the General Federation of Women's Clubs were instrumental in developing literary societies, libraries, and so in this state, uh, the women's clubs helped to found the West Virginia Library Association. And both of them, the Library Association and then uh, the women's clubs, were advocates for the creation of the Library Commission. You know, libraries have changed uh, quite a bit. We had a previous segment talking with Chuck Julian and uh, how libraries have changed over the years. And, you know, when you look at it, you spent 41 years in a library yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the kind of changes that you personally saw? Oh, good gracious. When I first started, we hand-checked out everything, you know, with the little stamp and the little library cards. And so, uh, you know, we did the uh, 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 computerization. Uh, we are doing more digital now. Um, the focus is um, shifted a little bit. I mean, we still, of course, do library books. We do library programming. Uh, we d had books on tape. Now you have the digital Kindles and everything. Um, it just, and libraries, I will say, have progressed as these new innovations come along. And um, now, of course, we're still providing reading. We still provide reference. Uh, and people think that if they see it on the internet, it must be true. <laughs> and librarians are there to guide you if you're doing uh, uh, any kind of research into the really good websites, the ones who give you the accurate information. I don't want to mention any others, but you know they, they kind of lead you to uh, where you can find correct information. Without the Library Commission, I think there would be no doubt that there would be communities that ha would not have library service in the state. Uh, they've always been in the forefront of providing that service, then creating buildings, and now today even providing internet connections throughout the state in communities that would not be able to afford those connections. So the Library Commission has been crucial in providing much needed and adequate and excellent service to the citizens of the state. We hope you've enjoyed our look back at 2018, and I hope we showed you how everyone can explore, discover, and create in West Virginia Public Libraries. We'll be back in 2019 with more programs on libraries and library life in West Virginia. I'm your host, Dan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.